for the reflections which have arisen in my own mind and have seemed to me to be helpful. Uh, they are all submitted to the correction of wiser heads. I think it's doing it. Is it doing it? I think so. <laughs> I'll have to log in. Um, the reason that you know I am the director of Reasonable Faith for the Kansas City area is because I was able to prove that I understood the, ma the materials discussed in uh, Dr. William Lane Craig's book, Reasonable Faith. Um, I suppose that's, that's good enough for him. Um, so before I move on, okay, and, and just don't keep this from, from you asking questions, okay? Um, I want you to ask him if, if, uh, if you ask something that I don't know, uh, that's great for me. Uh, I'll learn more, so we'll just we'll learn uh, with each other. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments about any of the emails that I sent before or anything before we get started? Okay. Um, up here is. Did, did, did you sign up? Okay. Um, there's a, I got this a little makeshift thing. If, if not, somebody isn't on the email list or whatever, just put your name, email address on there. Yes, I have a question about email. Yes. Did you send any in the last day? Like today? Like today? Or no, I did not send any like today. Or during the yesterday? No. Okay. No. I, I think I've sent... I don't know. I've sent a lot. <laughs> I've, I've sent like six or seven emails, something like that. Um, but did you get? You, have you gotten at least some of them? Yeah, have you gotten at least some of them. You should have gotten, got, like, gotten all of them. I'm thinking coming up here, I should have studied it a little better because it was like four or five or six different ways. Well, uh, just just because there's there's a couple or a few people that has not received emails that I'll just go over. Uh, real briefly, um, what I talked about is for us to have in the back of your mind uh, putting together um, your worldview and how to express that verbally with somebody else. It's hard to confront another person's worldview if you can't express your own worldview. Um, now I'll get a lot, a lot of my information for forming one's worldview, uh, I get from Robbie Zacharias, who, who says, uh, basically you answer four questions um, when you are answering or forming together your worldview, is origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Um, if you can answer those four questions, uh, you put together your worldview. Uh, origin, where do we come from? Meaning, what gives life meaning? Morality, how do we know what is good and what is bad? And destiny, uh, what happens when we die? And so I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to give your own, to formulate something right off the bat here or anything like that. It's just, I want you to think about it in the back of your head and as we go through these arguments, um, uh, it, hopefully this will help you formulate that better. And once we finish going through these arguments and, and making sure that people have an understanding of it, um, we, we will start to talk about how to do this, how to apply it in a practical way, and at that point, you, sh you should have a good understanding of, of your worldview and how to express that. Okay, does that make sense? Anybody have any questions? When you wrote origin, what was the other? Origin, meaning, meaning, morality, okay. and destiny. I was copying off her, so I can't read her writing. <laughs> Neither can she actually. <laughs> <laughs> I've printed out some of your emails if there's a copier. Hmm? I've printed out some of your emails if there's a copier. 
Uh, I don't know if I have access to the office or not. No, you don't. It's okay. <laughs> so I do not. I don't have an ac access to the office. I don't think I brought the paper that has all the money that this is in the um, For those that have not, for those that have just now signed up, I'll, I'll email you the emails that I've sent before so you, you can kind of get caught up in, on that, all that stuff. Okay. Any, any other questions uh, as far as like forming your worldview or uh, the absurdity of, of life? If, you know, answering the, the question of the, the meaning of life. Um, what's that? <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, it's just uh, if if you all were here at church today, it's, it's basically, you know, life becomes absurd if if God does not exist. Um, we we are here by mere chance, by mere accident. Um, there's no meaning, no purpose. Um, life becomes absurd without God, and so that's that's one way to confront somebody else's worldview and be able to formulate your own. Um, okay. All right, so now we're going to start with uh, truth. We're just going to start with our understanding of truth. Does truth exist? Can we know truth? Is truth relative? Um, what is the point of seeking knowledge if truth doesn't exist or we cannot know truth or everyone can have their own truth first let's discuss whether truth exists uh, what would you say if someone were to say there is no truth anybody <laughs> well, that, that's that's one way. That, that's actually not bad. Um, Frank Turk, an apologist that goes around the country and talks about this, um, he says half of what you'll know when confronting, half of what you need to know when confronting somebody else's worldview, is being able to apply what's called the no, the law of non-contradiction. So a good response would be, um, is that statement true? Somebody says, there is no truth, but you're making a truth claim. Yeah. Right? You, you're ma you, you are presupposing that your statement is true. So how do you know that that statement true is true if there is no truth? Right? It con contradicts each other. Yeah. It's called self-refuting. Um, this is a, a logical fallacy that occurs when concept A um, is used to deny concept B. So concept A being truth is used to deny truth, but it relies on there being truth. So you're, you're making a truth statement, right? Yeah. But you're relying on truth to actually exist for to make that statement. So it contradicts each other. That, that statement is self-refuting. Is that, does, anybody, does everyone get that? Any argument that is shown to be self-refuting should be considered an invalid argument. Did, did, did everyone can we move on? Does everyone get it? Okay. Can, can we know truth? Is it possible to know truth? Um, there's a story about a young man in college who, through his studies of philosophies on, on the internet, uh, began to question his own existence. It kept the young man up all night, tossing and turning, all the while wondering if he even existed. The next morning, he ran into the uh, philosophy professor's room and yelled, Professor, do I exist? The professor responded by saying, who's asking? Um, traditionally, um, 
we're, go we're going to get into some stuff, okay? So we'll take it slow. Traditionally, we can know truth and knowledge through two different categories. And th this, is, this is Latin. A priori or a post posteriori. A posteriori is, is knowledge through experience or empirical evidence. Empirical evidence is uh, knowledge that we gain through the senses. Like you see something, feel something, taste something, something like that. So for instance, like this floor below my feet, uh, no reasonable person that is a seeker of, of truth would deny that this floor is beneath my feet because we can see it, we can feel it, we can run tests to see if it actually exists. However, um, there are indeed people out there who, who criticize the knowledge gained from our senses. Um, for example, uh, just for example, how, how do we know that our situation is not like from the movie The Matrix? Um, how do we know that our brains aren't hooked up to some sort of computer program and everything is around us is just uh, a mere illusion uh, put together by, by some mad scientist or something. Um, <laughs> uh, the knowledge that we receive from our sen senses is, is what's called, it's, it's properly basic, it's a basic truth. It, it is true that I cannot prove with, with certainty that my brain is not in some sort of vat of chemicals being controlled by a mad scientist, but I have no reason to believe that this is the case. In general, it is most reasonable to accept the more common sense view. Uh, then it, and, and the burden of proof uh, is on the shoulders of somebody that would like bring up this thing. Like, Someone would say, how do you know that your brain isn't just in some of of chemicals or whatever? Well, my common sense tells me that. Um, but if you have some sort of good evidence for me to believe that, then go ahead and bring it up. But just by questioning my, my belief isn't enough to disprove it. Mm -hmm. Everyone get that? Mm -hmm. Right, just questioning it doesn't disprove it. You can question it all day long, but just because something that makes common sense to everybody it is, is, is a rational belief, okay? Now, uh, a priori is knowledge that is self-evident. Uh, this would include uh, mathematics, or deductions from pure reason. Um, like, for example, all bachelors are unmarried. Or, or green is a color. Something like that. Again, much of this knowledge is basic, and it just makes common sense. It, it would take a lot of evidence to disprove my existence. Oh, I already went that way. Um, so, this is more questionable, I guess. People could question this more because it's not like proved empirically. Mm -hmm. um, you can't feel it, you can't touch it. It's just, it's all in your mind. Um, but regardless, a lot of this can easily be responded of, of the question of how can we know truth? Or that you can't, somebody would make the statement, you can't know truth. It's impossible to know truth. You can just easily respond by saying, well, how do you know that that is true? Once again, you're, you're presupposing knowledge that you have by disproving what I know to be true. It's, it's self-refuting. Get it? <laughs> right, exactly. No, yeah. 100% circular reason. Uh, truth is relative. Uh, regardless of whether you believe we can actually know truth or not, there can be only one truth. In the same way that either this floor exists or it doesn't exist. Either I exist or, not, or I don't exist. 
Uh, to say that I both exist and do not exist goes against our basic understanding of logic itself. Uh, whenever someone brings up brings this up in the popular realm, it's usually, like I said, only a priori. But I'm going to we're going to show a video of of uh, Ravi Zacharias giving a speech here. Um, he he gives. This, he tell, he's, good, he's a good storyteller. And uh, he, he's going to tell a story about his own uh, confronting this whole idea of the, the law of non contradiction. This is the law of logic as it applies to reality. I don't know. I if remember it, speaking you to very people who were here familiar with this illustration, but I'm here in spite of one that I can hear back you. there. Can you hear us? Really loud back here. It's loud back there. Is, is that? Exactly. It's not coming like over here. Oh. Uh, hang on. Maybe I don't have to hear it. In one of that, a United States Western city, when one of the professors was attending the lecture, she was asked, do you speak against an Eastern religion? Okay. If we're all really quiet. Can you can you hear it? You can hear it. Can can hear it. it. All right. So just just play it. Two. He said, "I'm an American. I belong to that other Eastern religion. Let's just call it X." And he said that I have uh, taught this X religion in my lectures and so on. I want you to speak on the subject. Why you do not subscribe to the dogma of religion X? And my students will take you apart after your lecture. I said, "No, I really don't want to do that." I said, "God." Uh,
As I've said before, to, to disprove our basic understanding of logic would take a significant amount of evidence. Uh, just to question it does not disprove it, and we are more than justified in believing in it. And once again, we can apply the question here, is truth relative? Um, the state, no, the statement is an absolute truth. You're, you're trying to make, is that truth? Um, to say all truth is relative, you're trying to make an absolute truth claim, mm -hmm. right? You're trying. So, so like I said, once you learn how to apply the law of non-contradiction, a lot of these things you can just, just like it doesn't make any sense. It, it, it disobeys this law. The, the everything, like Robbie says, everything in our reality, the law of contradiction, is the best understanding of, of how of our own experience. So, it's the more common sense view. Okay. Any any questions? We got it. All right. Um, so we'll move on to the argument. Okay. Uh, these are uh, we're going to begin with the arguments for the existence of God, and then we'll go into um, arguments for the. Uh, the crucifixion. Um, 
Now, let me explain that these arguments are not meant to force someone into believing in God. Uh, do not expect, although it, it has happened, um, for someone to say, well, that makes logical sense. Okay, I guess I believe in God now. Um, these arguments are meant to show that a belief in God is more than reasonable. That indeed you are not committing intellectual suicide for believing in God. Uh, you would be giving someone the intellectual permission to believe in God. They would no longer be able to use that as an excuse. As apologist Greg Kokel says, uh, you are putting a rock in somebody's shoe. Um, it is meant to bother them as they think about the logical conclusions. However, I believe that these arguments show that our belief in God is more than reasonable than the opposing belief. Uh, one may say that one argument is not enough to believe in God, but you are building a cumulative case for God's existence. One must take all the arguments in account as a whole. These arguments also intend to show that God is the best explanation of the question posed in these arguments. One can view something and have an opposing view. I'll go ahead and show the next slide. Okay, everybody see this slide? Now, what, what is going on in this picture? Clearly, this man is ramming his face into that other man's fist. Right? Um, the, <clears throat> although some explanations are possible, um, they, they're not always the best explanation. Um, the arguments for the existence of God are in a deductive format. A deductive argument has a series of premises followed by a conclusion. So, um, the, the, the P and Q stuff, that's just, that's just logic stuff, okay? So, um, the way that this would be read is, if P is true, Q is true. The second premise is, P is true, and three would be the conclusion, therefore, Q is true, okay? That's a deductive argument. Got it. I see people still writing. Go back one? Yeah. Okay. Go back. Can you go back? <laughs> okay. Just let me know when, when we got it. Okay. Um. So here, here's a written out example. If today is Sunday, the library is closed. Today is Sunday, therefore, the library is closed. Okay? Um, for the conclusion to be true, the argument needs to be a sound argument. In order for the argument to be sound, it must first be a valid argument meaning the argument must obey the rules of logic. Uh, just, just for future, for future references, is the slides okay? Does the print need to be bigger? Can you read it okay? It needs to be bigger. Okay, I'll do it. This is even bigger than what they put in, so I just, I didn't know. So I'll make it bigger next time. Okay. But can, can y'all read it? And are there printouts that, we, that you can send us through an email? Right. I mean, no, not, no. I, I, can, I can send out the PowerPoint in, in, the, in the emails. I can send that out. Um, this is put in, in Keynote. I don't know if you all got Macs or not. Um, well, okay. Well, the, the pro the, that's a problem, though. Like, I, read the, I wrote this out in Keynote because I knew that that's what this computer is back here, okay? Um, 
you cannot, you cannot, the Keynote makes the files really big, okay? Like this in the PowerPoint format is like, like 15 megabytes or something like that. In the Keynote format, it's like 130 megabytes. So I can, I can send this out in PowerPoint. If you can't read it with your Mac, there's a program called OpenOffice. It's free. And just download OpenOffice, and then you can look at, at PowerPoint formats through OpenOffice. Okay? Will it open in PowerPoint? Huh? I will send it out in PowerPoint. Oh. Uh, like I wrote, I wrote this out in Keynote, Keynote, and I'll extract it to a PowerPoint format so I can actually send it out because because Keynote is too big. The file's too big for me to send out in in email. So I, I'll send it out in PowerPoint. If you if if you have a MacBook that doesn't have PowerPoint, download Open Office, and that can open up the file. Okay. Uh, let's see. If it is a valid argument and the premises are true, then the argument is a sound argument. Now, the arguments that I give you all obey the rules of logic, which means they are all valid arguments. I have never seen or heard, besides just random people on the internet, state that these arguments are invalid. Um, at any kind of academic professor uh, recognizes these as valid arguments. They, they obey the rules of logic, okay? Um, so you don't need to worry about doubt. And I'm not going to request, you, request for you to learn the rules of logic. We're, we're not going to get into that. If, if you would like to learn that, then, you know, contact me. And, and I'll try to put something aside for, for us, you know, for me to teach it. But for right now, I'm not going to force everybody here to learn the rules of logic. Um, so let's look what I mean by the premises being true or not and how this affects the argument. Now, look at the example argument. If today is not Sunday, then premise two is false. And uh, so that means the argument is not sound, and that means the conclusion can be false. Okay? If, but if all the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. Okay? So all we need, can be, all we need to be concerned with in this class is how to defend the premises. For someone to den deny the conclusion in, the, in a deductive argument, okay, this is, this is how philosophy goes, this is the rules of logic. For someone to deny the conclusion, they have to show that one of the premises is more false than true. Certainty is not required in a deductive argument. By certainty, I mean that the premise is without any doubt whatsoever true. You do not have to prove that. It just needs to, you just need to prove that it is, is more true than false. Um, remember like how I said, I can't prove beyond any reasonable, well, reasonable, I can't prove without any doubt whatsoever that my brain is not in a vat of chemicals, right? I can't prove that beyond any kind of certainty whatsoever. It's impossible. But I don't have to. Certainty is not required in, in the argument. Get it? You got it, Randy? I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, what, what, what can I, how can I help you? <laughs> okay, like, like, um, I'm trying to say, think of another way to explain. Is it certainty? You don't understand certainty, or you just you don't understand that you you you're not required to prove certainty. 
So I, if the argument is my brain is in a vat of whatever you said, chemicals, chemicals and yeah. all that, that's the argument. And that's like somebody to that's pose That's a that. statement or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have um, to prove that it's not. Right. What, what I'm saying is I, you do not have to prove beyond any doubt whatsoever. Mm. You know, you know, in a in a court case, okay, that a, uh, the defendant has to prove beyond any reasonable doubt. Okay, they're not saying beyond any doubt whatsoever. You can come up with a doubt, but it's not reasonable. A doubt being like my brain is in a vat of chemicals. That can be a doubt. But it's not a reasonable doubt because it goes, it, it goes, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make common sense. So you don't have to prove beyond any kind of doubt that somebody can come up with, or any kind of objection that anybody can come up with. All you have to prove is that this is the more reasonable option than the other option. Okay. Okay. And that's what's called a sound argument. Yes, if, if you're able to prove that the, uh, the, the premises, if it's a valid argument, meaning it follows the rules of logic, and the premises are shown to be more true than false, then that's a sound argument. Okay? Any other questions? It's okay, if you got them, go ahead. Okay, all right. So... How's everybody doing? Do, do people need to go home or anything? Are we, are we good to go? <laughs> okay. Um, so, like, I, I don't have a point to where I, I need to end or something. Just, just let, you know. We're, we're just going. All right. I have the, one quick question. Okay. Um, is this under deductive reason? Is a sound argument is this under the deductive All, all this stuff is, is all about deductive arguments. Um, our first argument, all right, this is the first one. It's called Leibniz's contingency argument. You don't have to know what contingency means yet. Just write it down. <laughs> we'll get there. All right. Um, this argument was developed by a German mathematician and philosopher, Gottfried Leibniz. And it's meant to be a philosophical answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? All right, we're going we're gonna to play a video. It's not going to be as loud as it should be, but we're just kind of rolling with it. Get rid of, can you, can you get rid of Robbie and then bring that one up or get rid of the other one and bring the other one up? Everybody, I'll send everybody a video. It's cool. It's just, maybe I'll play it. I'll play it the next there time. It oh, there it is. Right okay. <laughs>
Okay. Um, let's let's unpack this. Um, this is a what's called a cosmological argument. Um, a cosmological argument basically concludes that the universe requires a cause. Um, so one may ask what caused that and continue to ask that question in order to stop asking the question in infinity, to, you know, in order for them to stop asking what caused that, and all right, so what caused that, okay, so what caused that, in order for you to stop asking that question, eventually you have to have an uncaused cause, okay? What? Okay, like uh, un, uh, like Aristotle calls it, uh, uh, it's required. What's required is an unmovable mover. An un <laughs> so, so um, you know, you you can keep going back, back and back and back and back and back. Like what caused me my parents? What caused my parents? Blah blah blah. Um, it depends on your views of evolution and how this is going to continue. But eventually, you'll get to the universe, right? And so, what caused the universe? It still requires a cause, but nothing's before it. But there has to be a cause, okay? There has to be an uncaused cause. Get it? Yes, yes. You have to find, it, there has to be something that's not created, or there, there's nothing that caused that to exist. It's, it's, it's required. That's what a cosmological argument is, is that, the, that there has to be an uncaused cause. The universe requires something that couldn't cause it. Okay? Um, Premise one states that anything that can exist has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its nature or in an external cause. Now, let's make sure we uh, understand uh, things that exist necessarily versus things that exist contingently. For something to exist necessarily, it means that it's impossible for it ex to exist any other way. In fact, that, in fact, if it exists, it's impossible for it not to exist. That's what it means by, I know this is like, <laughs> but, but um, that's, that's what necessarily existing means. Now, like the video says, not a lot enters into that, okay? Um, like some, some think, some mathematicians, I'm not gonna, I won't go there. So, so, some mathematicians think that numbers are, are required to exist, okay? It's impossible for them to be existing any other way. Like think of the number seven, okay? If, if the number seven actually exists, okay, it's impossible for it not to be the number seven. Mm -hmm. It can't be the number three, it can't be the number eight, it has to be the number seven. It's impossible for it not to be the number seven. Now you can call it something else besides the number seven. You can have some sort of made up word or term that, that you would call the number seven other than the number seven. But the concept of the number seven has to be the number seven. It can't be anything different. Okay? Is that as clear as mud? <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. All right, let's think of, now I'm, like when I say that the number, like math or numbers actually exist, 
I'm not saying that I believe that numbers actually exist, like it's, it's something out there that exists. Um, um, have <laughs> uh, okay, so let, let's say um, an, another abstract object would be something called justice. Okay? Does justice actually exist? Um, that, that, that if, it, if it does exist, it's, it would be impossible for it not to exist or for it to be something different. Or it wouldn't be justice. Okay? Um, so, And, and also, abstract objects do not um, do not um, are, are not required for humans to exist. Okay, even if humans did not exist, okay, if the number if the number three exists, it would still be required to exist. Okay, so let let's think of all right. Humans don't even exist at all, but there are like three planets in the universe. And that's all there is, just three planets. Even if humans didn't exist, there would still be three planets. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it doesn't require for, uh, for humans to exist, for a necessarily being to exist. Mm -hmm. So if it does exist, it has to exist, and it can't, ex it can't be anything other than what it is. So if God does exist, he exists necessarily. It is impossible for his nature to change. It is impossible for him not to exist. The universe may not exist, but he remains. The universe could pass away, but he still remains. Everything else exists contingently meaning it is, it is possible for it to exist differently than how it actually exists now. It is possible for the universe to not exist. And it's certainly possible for the universe to exist differently than how it is. Like we can think of a world where unicorns exist. Or, <laughs> or, or monkeys that have wings. Or, or Mount Everest, Mount Everest doesn't exist at all, or for the Earth to never exist at all. We we can imagine all these things that are possible. It's possible that it could have been this way. It doesn't actually exist this way, but it's possible for that for that could have happened. It could have been like that. Okay, that's what contingently means. Yeah. Do you, do you understand the... So it's kind of like saying, um, I exist. It even, um, and my, my blouse exists. But if my blouse didn't exist, that wouldn't change the fact that I do. Is, it, is that the same? Um, we, can, we, can, we can think of a world where it's possible that my shirt doesn't exist. We can think of a world where I don't exist. If my parents didn't meet, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. Okay? We can think of a world whenever the universe began, Earth was not created. It's possible for, the, for these things to happen that way. It's not necessary for me to exist. It's not necessary for my shirt to have been made. Okay. You get it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just trying to. So really, this this argument, in my mind, only oh, makes any sense if we're talking about God, because He's the only being ever that doesn't depend on anything else. Exactly. I do. Mm -hmm. My shirt does. The universe does. Mm -hmm. Correct. Absolutely. argument only works with God. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
That is, that's the whole point of the argument, is that the only thing that exists, that could exist necessarily, and that could cause the universe to happen the way it is, is God. He's the only option. That's, that's the argument. And the, the knowledge the knowledge of God is the knowledge of God a priori? Yeah. 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 We can't empirically prove God's existence. But it's but it's self evident. Yes. Uh, well, um, a a philosopher by the name of Alvin Plantica uh, made the argument that the a belief in God is a basic belief. It's a basic reasonable belief. Mm -hmm. Huh? Is it time to stop? <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, I guess we'll stop there. Dana's saying we gotta stop. I guess we gotta, like, the babysitter's gotta go and all that stuff. Right. So, okay, so we'll stop there, and next time we'll pick it up. Um, okay, yeah, just next there. We, we basically just will end with explaining the difference between things that exist necessarily and things that exist contingently. Okay. And then we'll pick up the argument after that. Okay. Okay? And, any other questions before we stop? Go ahead. So basically, are we saying that, um, and, and you know, we have an easy time believing this, whereas other people want to argue about this, but you can take this argument back and back and back and back, but you're always going to be stuck with all of this came from something mm -hmm. who created that something, mm -hmm. and they want to say there is no God, and you have to say to them, then, then how did this happen? Yeah, something, something had to have caused. So the only logical explanation is that there is a being that caused Correct. Like you, you may not like the term God, but like the video can, like the video says, you can call it something else. Yeah. But it, but it's still an uncaused cause. Yeah. Can you give one more example of contingent existence? Um, anything that doesn't exist necessarily. So the only things that exist that could that could exist necessarily is God and abstract objects. Okay. Abstract objects, even if they do exist, cannot uh, have an effect on anything. Okay, numbers doesn't have an effect on my existence. Okay, A everything besides that is contingent. Like, all right. So let let's let's think of an example. Let's say that I like I got here okay. I got here fine. Everything everything happened. Is fine, okay? Now we can imagine a, a world or uh, a possibility world where I attempted to I attempted to come here, but I was I got in a car accident, okay? And I died. So I didn't make I didn't make it here. Okay? So because that happened to me, I I don't necessarily Okay, we, we, and this whole world where I made it here okay doesn't necessarily exist. Okay, we can think of other possibilities of our reality than the one that we're currently in. So it's contingent. Okay. Okay. Anything else? You can. I you, can't you, write you, that fast. No, uh, I, I, like I said, I'll, 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 I'll put, I'll send the PowerPoint out in an email, and so you, you know, you write for the notes. Feel free to research more on your own. Uh, you're basically, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily everything say everything on Wikipedia is like true. I know. So um, you basically have to take that into your own hands. 
Um, but yeah. Yeah, and I, I will also put it, I'll also share the videos like the Ravi Zacharias did and the, the one on the contingent argument. Great, thank you. Do, do all of you want to invite Mr. Reed to full stage too? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm on the list. Yeah, if 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 you have not every I understand not everybody's on Facebook, but if you're if you're on Facebook then, then I can invite you to the group, but either I or, or my wife has to be Facebook friends with you for for me to invite you to a group. Are you friends? <laughs> so who, who do we, I'm sorry, I don't Yeah, I can. I got. I brought it with me if you want to look at it. If you if you want to see what it looks like. Yeah, see what it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Anything else before we just shut this thing down? Before we just just converse. All right. All right. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> I will make them bigger. <laughs> <laughs>